Hello, and welcome to Take a Break with Smithsonian Science Games. For many of you, this is going to be your first session of the conference, so I'd like to welcome you all to this year's summit. This year's theme is Together We Thrive, Creating Our Shared Future Through Education. And that really acknowledges that given the right conditions and the right resources, all children can thrive. And also to improve uh, their outcomes, we all have to work together. Uh, there are some really, really amazing talks today uh, I'm, I'm super excited about. Immediately following this session is today's keynote featuring Dr. Aliyah Samuel. She's the CEO of the Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning. And she's going to be talking about just that, about what's the impact of prioritizing social and emotional learning in the classroom. At the end of the day, we have uh, the closing keynote I'm so psyched about, uh, best-selling author Jason Reynolds. Um, I'm, I'm just so excited to hear him talk. He's going to talk about some of those tough issues that he's tackling with his writing and about how he helps youth find their own voices, which is so important. Um, but for me, I'm so honored to start your day, and we're going to have a really exciting discussion about some of the really, really incredible work uh, a few of our scientists have been doing. And we're also going to have a bit of fun by playing some games about their work as well. So next slide is my introduction. All right. So... Hi, everyone. My name is Cody Coltharp. Uh, a quick verbal dis uh, description. I'm a, a goofy looking Caucasian male. I've got short blonde hair that's going gray quickly because of my two mischievous children. Uh, they will not be bursting in on this Zoom call naked and covered in spaghetti because I'm sitting in my office and uh, it's it's clean for the first time in about five years. So that's what that's what's on the screen. Uh, anyways, I'm a I'm a digital interactive designer at the Smithsonian's Office for the Undersecretary for Education. And our office is, is relatively new. Uh, it was established to define the institution's educational priorities and goals, and also act as a, a kind of central hub uh, to education to connect the like 300 plus educators that are spread out across our, our 21 museums, our research centers, and National Zoo. And many of them you're gonna hear from today during today's talks. Uh, before we get any farther in the talk, some quick housekeeping. So live closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC, where's my finger? The CC button uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you're not seeing it right now, try refreshing your browser and then it might come up. Um, in addition to that, we also have a, a, a live ASL interpreter whose window's currently penned. And I, I just wanted to thank you both for your work. You're doing a great work. We've seen throughout the conference, you're doing really good jobs. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to the agenda in the next slide. Uh, so today, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you three projects from our How to Be a Scientist Smithsonian Role Model Series. And at any given time, you can, you can ask questions throughout the talk by using that tab on the right. Um, and I'll also be giving you question prompts for each of the sections, but feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, so I've told you about what we're gonna be talking about next slide goes over why we're talking about it. So uh, the Smithsonian is well known for housing and curating millions and millions of objects and specimens and artworks and artifacts and on and on. Uh, but working here, I've met so many gifted historians and scientists and archivists and educators, and they're all doing this really innovative and interesting work taking all that stuff and, uh, and weaving it all together into that, that magical journey of learning that's the Smithsonian that you've all experienced. Uh, so in the next slide, how do, how do we tell their stories since their unique perspectives influence so much about what the Smithsonian story is, what, what the American story is, what our shared story as humans is. So what, what, what can we do to tell their stories? Um, the kits I'll be sharing today uh, are based around the work and contributions of three very, very successful, uh, very awesome, as you will see, contemporary Smithsonian women scientists. And in the next slide, you'll see some of the projects that we've worked on them with. Uh, so yeah, we, we've worked closely with these scientists to transform and, and package their work into these three freely available project kits that communicate the story of their research and their careers. And each kit that I'll be sharing today, we're gonna to introduce the scientist, we're gonna introduce her work and why that work matters. All right, so the next slide is kit components. Uh, all three of the kits I'll be sharing today have this range of high, high touch to high tech educational resources from hands-on classroom activities 
to online interactive games and also uh, some really fun video biographies about the scientists' lives and their careers. Uh, the target audience for this is going to be ranging from students grade four all the way up to nine, and all of them are aligned to next generation science standards. Uh, so for the way it's going to work, uh, for each of the three projects, I'll share a quick trailer to introduce the project, and we'll go briefly uh, through each of the uh, project kit components. So let's get started with the very first one. Journey through an exploded star. <laughs> This is, a, this is a kit about the work of Dr. Kimberly Arcand. She is totally awesome. Uh, she's a data visualization expert and she, she's at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And she translates bits and bytes, uh, you know, like zeros and ones from telescopes and observatories into pictures and stories that make the astrophysical uh, phenomena, they, it just brings them to life. Um, I saw her give this talk about scanning this supernova remnant. And that's, that's basically like all this stuff, a, a, star, a star sneezes out when it dies uh, and it, it like spreads across the universe and, and eventually becomes everything that we can see and, and are. Uh, well, anyway, she took a 3D scan of all of that stuff. She took scans of it. And um, I thought it would just be this perfect opportunity to, to show something that we can't see or experience in real life because most of the data that she was using, it's just totally invisible to our eyes. And we can never go there. We can never see it because it's like billions or trillions of miles away. And that is one of the biggest considerations for all three of these projects. Why are we doing something as a game when it would be better suited as a video or a worksheet or a simple graphic? What's the best way to communicate the concept or the content? What can a game do that other mediums can't do? What can a game do that traditional museum settings can't do? So that's what we're always thinking about. So I'm gonna play a quick trailer video to introduce the project and then we'll get into it. Let's go ahead. Imagine one of the most powerful explosions in the universe, a catastrophic blast known as a supernova. Now, imagine having the power to watch this explosion with hypervision that allows you to see it across many kinds of light. The Smithsonian's new online interactive lets you journey through an exploded star with a visualization based on actual data from multiple telescopes of the remnants of a real supernova. When a star dies, there is a sudden and powerful gravitational collapse and almost instantly, the insides of the star explode out into the universe. Now, you have the ability to explore the aftermath of one such violent explosion and manipulate the real data to make your own visualization of the cosmos. Your guide for this spectacular explosion is Dr. Kimberly Arcand, a leading expert in high energy data visualization, scientist and science communicator for the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Visit the Smithsonian Learning Lab and see for yourself. Okay, done with that. So we're going to go into the main project page here for Journey Through an Exploded Star. And uh, scrolling down, you can see that there are three main components. On the left has that online interactive simulation. In the middle is a 360 YouTube video version of that experience. And on the right is a link to the classroom activity. And that's where we recommend starting on all three of these so that they have that foundational knowledge before they go and play the game. So let's go into it. All right, so we're going to pop into it, and uh, you can see how it's laid out. I don't know if you recognize this website, but uh, all three are facilitated through the Smithsonian's Learning Lab platform. It's a free uh, online interactive platform designed with educators in mind. Uh, it's built for discovering all those millions of things that I was talking about, but also using those resources to create content, uh, you know, online activities for your students using online tools. And it's also a space for sharing those tools with the tens of thousands of, of other educators that are, that are using the platform. So if you're not familiar, I highly recommend checking it out. There was a session yesterday that'll be archived where they kind of do a walkthrough. And if you go to the website, they also have uh, online office hours where you can um, check in with the team that's live. So check them out. 
Uh, I have a deep dive video of all of these that will be in the session. Uh, there's a PDF in the session description. So if you want to go to that, if you don't hear any of the web links, you can go to that and there's longer videos. But I want to give you kind of a preview of everything so you have a general idea. Um, in this activity, they're going to be learning about the fundamentals of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, how cosmic objects are visualized by combining the optical, infrared, and X-ray data, and how all of those are layered together um, in a process similar to how an MRI machine scans sections of the brain and then combines them all together, uh, you know, like a layer cake or like an ogre, because the layers. Um, and then how Dr. Arcand and her team assembled all that original data into a cool 3D model. Uh, you can also find in this collection a link to the interactive simulation, we'll, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, and then it ends with some really fun extension activities that you can do with your students, how they can take a picture of the cosmos remotely using a real remote telescope, because in the age of COVID, even the telescopes are working remotely. They got the top lens, it's all business at the top, it's a button up, but the bottom lens is just wearing sweatpants. Uh, James Webb Telescope, you're on mute, turn your mic on. Um, the last tile you can see is uh, uh, a video of Dr. Arcand. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go into that um, in the next slide. Uh, but in, in addition to all of this really cool, fun science content, we also have uh, videos of all the different scientists that we're going to be sharing. And we think it's important to, to show how the various and dynamic types of career pathways uh, that scientists can have that they're real people, that they're really funny, and they have these interesting lives. So I'm going to share uh, a portion of that video in the last little, the last little tile there uh, so that you get the idea, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. As a mom of a girl who's interested in science and math, it's just really important being able to provide those role models. One time, I think it was fifth grade for her, I went into her class and I was doing a lesson on the evolution of stars and this idea that, you know, stars live their lives and then end up in some other form. And one of her friends came up to me and at the end of the lesson, she said to me, I didn't know mommies could be scientists. And the fact that she said that out loud and I was able to absorb it, it just hit me that more work needs to be done. All right, so that was Dr. Arcand. I told you she's totally awesome. Uh, she, oh, can we pause that video real quick, real quick? Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Dr. Arcand. Uh, you know, she, she is just, she's really rad. She, she rocks this pink hair. Uh, you know, she ditched this white lab coat. Um, for her her leather motorcycle jacket that's that's covered in NASA patches, and she does this groundbreaking, innovative, highly specialized data visualization, and that was one of the the huge goals of this project uh, to break that stigma of what a scientist is, who they are, who they're allowed to be, what they're like. Um, in that video, and all three of the videos, you'll also see some of the students that uh, these scientists have mentored, and that was another one of the big goals of these videos is for you to be able to share that next generation of scientists with your students, for them to see uh, that there are these young college age students that are doing this really impactful science. All right, so in this video, in the next one right, right now, we can play it now, uh, we're gonna get into the game part of this session on games. Um, so uh, this is the interactive. You can see there's narrated tour and free explore as well. And, uh, all three are closed captioned um, and they're just run through the browsers. So you can see on this slide there, there's a little bit of information about the telescopes that that uh, collected the data. This slide is about how to move around. The forward arrow key moves forward, left click and drag to look around and back arrow key uh, to, to move backwards. And uh, this here is a slide back to that learning lab uh, collection. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started on it. All right, so here we are. Um, we are in the video, and uh, at the bottom, you can see uh, there's some controls you might recognize. That one is reset, that one is play, and that one is turn closed captions on and off. And if we go ahead and hit play on this, um, you're not going to be able to hear it, but 
Dr. Arcand is currently narrating, uh, and during this narration, she goes over all the different types of data that the, the telescopes have picked up, the elements that are represented there, and uh, how it all kind of explodes out into the universe and eventually becomes us. Um, you know, over 50% of the atoms in our, our body once came from exploded stars. So we're, we're not just the stuff of stars, but the stuff of stars that have traveled like trillions of miles uh, to become us. Um, so this, this, it goes a little bit longer. Um, we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit uh, so that you can go on and see at any time by pressing that free explore button in the bottom right so that they can then kind of manipulate the data on their own. Um, but here it is, here's Cassiopeia A. It stretches out about 10 light years. Um, the controls are the same. You can left click and drag to look around. Uh, you can press the forward arrow key to move forward and the back arrow key to move back. Um, and at any given time, you can hover your mouse over to the left slide, uh, to the left side, and you can see there's a bunch of kind of nozzles on the left hand side. Uh, so the top nozzles, the top three, represent red, green, and blue color channels. And adjusting these changes the whole color of the visualization. Um, since all this data is just it's just black and white. Um, data uh, scientists assign kind of arbitrary colors uh, to represent those different elements. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, you can change all the colors. Below that are all the other nozzles. And so these are all the different separate elements. Um, since all these elements have different weights and wavelengths, the scientists are able to scan them individually and divide them out. And nozzling through any one of those different layers will increase that layer's intensity. Um, and hovering over the element's name, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about the element and how they scanned it and, you know, what it is that you're seeing. Um, all right, so at any time, you can press that bottom right for the question mark, and you can get a, a, a reminder on how to play. And then in the bottom right of the slider menu, it'll reset all the nozzles and sliders, and in the bottom left, we'll go back home. And that is that. Uh, so when they're done with this visualization, they'll head back to the Learning Lab collection for some wrap-up and then have that option to complete those extension activities if they want to. So now your first question prompt. Um, and there's a little bit of delay, so it's going to take a little while for you to put your questions in and, for, and then for me to see them. Um, but Dr. Arkan, she specializes in using data to tell stories. And sometimes that's a complex 3D rendering like you've just seen, and other times it's a simple graphic that's all that's needed. So what are some examples of difficult concepts or curriculum related to science or not that you're struggling to make relevant uh, or easy to understand? Are there techniques that you're using that uh, present them differently that have helped? Because I, I want to know them so I know what to build next. And if you have good solutions to those problems, I want to steal them. Uh, I'm going to borrow your brilliance. So, uh, so let's take a question now. Um, let's see. Do we have any questions yet? I'm still waiting on questions. Um, again, a good reminder that within the, the, the slides that you saw, anytime I'm telling you a website like the Learning Lab or uh, you know, any of the main pages, that we have that session PDF and uh, the bottom of the PDF uh, is that link to all the, the, the bonus content that I'll be talking about. So. Um, don't worry about writing down or don't worry about if you miss um, a link that I've said. All right, so we have a, a question from Alex D. Uh, it is, how do we make, um, we're struggling to teach uh, uh, um, climate change with our students and not having the supports that we need from our schools in teaching climate change um, how can we approach this massive, massive problem? Uh, and that is <laughs> like such a perfect question to ask because that's the very next project that we're going to be talking about um, with the work of Dr. Nancy Knowlton. Uh, so uh, my recommendation on that one is, is we're just going to stay tuned and, and, and learn about how we've approached trying to solve that problem because it it's such a huge problem and it needs a lot of people working on a lot of different solutions uh, to, to, to try to solve it. Um, so uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go on to the, to the next slide so, so you have a better idea about that. 
Um, so, so next up is the Secrets of the Sea project. Uh, this one is presenting the work of Dr. Nancy Knowlton. And she is, I gotta take a deep breath, here's a long title. The former Sant Chair Emeritus for Marine Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Believe me, that title isn't long enough. She needs at least like Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons, Protector of the Seven Seas, added on to the end. Uh, you know, she's just absolutely a legend of the marine biology world. And we could probably do an entire summit uh, just on the projects that she's worked on. Um, the next slide goes over, you know, why, what we were thinking when we were doing this. Um, and that, that's like our, you know, the question that was just in the chat. Talking with educators, we hear it all the time. How do we get our students to care about climate change? It's either too big of a problem or it feels uh, too far off into the future or it just doesn't concern them. How do we present the effects uh, of, of a climate changing on the oceans in a more meaningful or relevant or accessible way? And the other part, the other challenge is how do we do it without focusing on the doom and gloom? Dr. Knowlton's whole approach is that combating climate change uh, uh, by scaring people into action, it just doesn't work, right? Bombarding them with all the negative data with you know, all these facts, people don't respond to it. Uh, so we, we have to try something a little bit different. So I'm going to play again a quick intro video of, of this project, and then we'll get into the kit. Since the extinction of the dinosaurs, coral reefs have been the most diverse marine ecosystems on the planet, providing shelter and food for generations of ocean life. What mysteries are hidden within, waiting to be discovered? Dive into an incredible underwater adventure in the Smithsonian's Secrets of the Sea online game. You'll navigate the hidden treasures of a coral reef, discovering the connections between the tiniest plants to the largest predators. The more you discover, the closer you will be to recreating a healthy ecosystem, returning life to the coral reef. Your guide on your submerged quest is Dr. Nancy Knowlton, renowned marine biologist and former Sant Chair for Marine Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Visit the Smithsonian Learning Lab and start your adventure. All right, so here it is. This is the Secrets of the Sea main page. And it's the same setup as before. Uh, scrolling down, you can see that we have all three of those main kit elements. On the left-hand side, you have the interactive game. Uh, middle is a video biography of Dr. Knowlton. And on the right is that classroom activity. And we'll jump into that just like before. Um, so again, you'll recognize the Learning Lab platform and the layout. Uh, this activity is NGSS aligned to fourth and fifth grade, but it could very easily be scaled up. Uh, so what you're seeing, it's split into six kind of modular activities, and uh, you can use or adapt them to your to your own audiences. But you can see there's kind of bookmarks for each horizontal line, and those are roughly divided into the six different activities. Um, the Cliff's Notes version of this is that students are going to learn about coral reefs, and they're going to learn about the life that they support, and also the threats that they face with a, a, a changing global climate. There's also uh, a link to playing the game. And in the game, they'll see how all these sea life are connected that the reef supports. And then when they're done playing the game, when they're done with the experience, they'll come back into the learning lab uh, for some reflection questions and then also some helpful tips of how they can take action um, and also stories of things that groups of others have done that, that have taken action that have helped. Um, so some positive stories. Uh, there's also, again, that video, uh, biographical video of Dr. Knowlton, where she's offering a glimpse of her career uh, that, that spanned like, decades studying the changes in the oceans. And, um, and again, introducing that next generation of scientists that are using that cutting edge uh, technology to understand the impact of the uh, humans on the oceans. All right, so let's get into the game in the next slide. Okay, so here we are. Um, I've skipped ahead a little bit, uh, past an introduction scene that tells you how to, how to move and what the controls are. Um, but in this game, your students are gonna navigate this 3D coral reef. 
And uh, what you're seeing are um, actual 3D coral scans from the Smithsonian's collections. And they're doing this in order to kind of discover the connections of sea life that, that share the reef. So the student will kind of approach uh, uh, an organism, and when they come close, they'll discover that organism representing uh, its color returning. So everything starts really white and gray, and then they get close to it, and it regains that color. It kind of restores it to life. And that's a metaphor for this bleached reef coming back to life, that it all starts white and gray and muted colors. And as they discover more and more sea life, the reef is able to uh, support more and more diverse species, right? So that by bringing new sea life for them, uh, they're able to find more uh, to search and discover. All right, so for example, um, finding four seagrass will make a sea star appear, which eats the grass, and finding a sea, uh, the sea star will allow other um, organisms to appear. What you're seeing uh, now is by right-clicking, you can get an overview view of what, that, uh, what those connections look like, what the, uh, the food web is. And if you click on the little question marks, you can see, okay, there's something hidden and these are the dependencies that it needs. Um, and in general, the goal is to complete that full healthy food web from the transfer of energy from the sun to the microscopic plankton, all the way up to the apex predators of the reef. Uh, so um, you can't hear it right now, uh, but if you find all of a species, it'll, it'll play a fun cutscene animation of Dr. Knowlton narrating a little bit about that organism. Uh, so you can see the, the sea star ahead, we'll go, we'll go discover that and it'll play, uh, play that, that cutscene animation. Um, so Dr. Knowlton narrates, she's a, she's a great order. She, you know, she's super interesting. She talks a little bit about each one. Uh, we also got Kate Bush to do the soundtrack. Um, you know, she, she, she's, she's back in, she's back in style and she created a whole new song just for this. Uh, keep swimming through that reef. Find a fish to eat. It's on Spotify now. You can listen to it. It's, it's super popular. Um, so anyways, when they're done with all of that, they found the sea life. The game ends uh, with this really fun bit of cooperative hunting by the, the reef's apex predators, uh, showing that the reef is fully capable of supporting a wide network of organisms. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes to complete the entire game. And again, when they're done, they head back to the Learning Lab collection for those reflection questions. And going back to that main thesis question of, you know, what do you think happens to, to all this sea life when, when climate changes the oceans? Since they're all connected, uh, you know, if, if, if one element is gone, it trickles down to all of them. Um, all right, so our next question prompt is going to be on the next slide. So it's a, it's a simple question uh, with very hard solutions. Um, what are ways that you've struggled to teach climate change? Um, so I'll give you a second to, to, to write in some answers, and then we'll jump into it. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about our strategy, uh, again, because we are, are working with, uh, with Dr. Knowlton, um, and her whole, her whole strategy is that she wants to take a positive approach to it. Uh, so our approach was to, like, display these funny creatures with their, like, really interesting personalities, you know, by, by Dr. Knowlton kind of talking about each one individually and you can kind of see how they're swimming around there. They're just kind of adorable. Uh, like there's this one, <clears throat> the Halimata crab, it literally puts on this plant on its head, like a top hat to, to hide from predators, which is to me, it's hilarious. Um, there's also parrotfish uh, that will eat the coral and their poop eventually becomes beaches. The white sand beaches that we have is coral fish poop. And I, I think that's just like, you know, so, so funny. And to get the students to kind of, begin to care about them. Um, you know, I, I think that's been our approach and a kind of a successful one, you know, to, to get them to really care about them. All right. So do we have any questions yet? Uh, I don't see any. Um, I'll tell you one of the questions, uh, or one of the answers that Dr. Knowlton gave in the webinar. Um, she said, uh, one of the teachers asked, you know, like, how do I get, um, I have this one student that, that uh, will, will um, just says like, the, it's too big for, for me, so I'm, I don't care. And Dr. Knowlton's response was, it's too big for any one person. It's not about one person. It's not about, you know, an individual doing something amazing. It's about groups of people that come together, that work together to make a big change. 
And it's not about one solution. Uh, it's like Swiss cheese, you know, like the more slices of Swiss cheese, you know, one Swiss slice of Swiss cheese has all these holes. But if you slay, layer all these different solutions, all these different slices of Swiss cheese together and try to look through it, you know, all the holes kind of make up for each other. Um, so Dr. Knowlton suggests the Swiss cheese solution for climate change. OK, so we are going to move on uh, to the next section on to the third and final kit. Predator versus prey. Um, this is based on the work of Dr. Rachel Page. Uh, she's a behavioral ecologist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. She lives there. Uh, her backyard is literally her laboratory. And uh, yeah, she's made a, a career out of studying these mechanisms that enable predators to find their prey and the ones that help their prey avoid those predators. And if that doesn't sound like a game to me, then nothing does. Uh, so. I saw a video of her and she was talking about her work and I thought, oh my God, how fun would a game be about echolocation, right? So here's the sense that we don't have and, and can't experience in, in any normal way, right? So how could we portray that using technology, using a game environment? Um, so in the next slide, we're gonna play that introduction video, play the, play the introduction trailer and jump to the main page from there. All right. Under the lush canopy of a tropical rainforest, a constant game of survival is being played out amongst creatures of all sizes. It's survival of the fittest in this high stakes environment. And now you've got a chance to see if you've got what it takes. Get in touch with your primal side with the Smithsonian's new online game, Predator vs. Prey. In this two player game, you can choose to play as the Tungara frog, traveling and serenading potential mates while trying to avoid the watchful eye of potential predators. Or you can play as the fringe-lipped frog-eating bat who hunts with its keen sense of hearing and by sending out ultrasonic waves as it soars through the forest looking for prey. This experience is based on the research of behavioral ecologist Dr. Rachel Page of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Visit the Smithsonian Learning Lab and start your adventure. All right, so here we are in the main splash page. And this one's really interesting for me to see my own evolution as a game designer, you know, starting with Journey Through an Exploded Star, which is just so sleek and so sterile, uh, to this one, which is much more stylized and it, it just has a lot more personality and a bit more of, of my own, you know, my own humor. Um, so anyway, scrolling down, it's the same exact thing as before, broken in the same way. On the left side is the interactive game. Uh, in the middle is a video biography of Dr. Page. And on the right is the classroom activity. And we'll jump right into that. Uh, so again, it's the same thing. It's the Learning Lab platform, no surprises here. And uh, the Cliff's Notes version of this activity is that students are going to learn about predator-prey interactions between fringe lip bats and Tungara frogs. And uh, they're going to learn a little bit about their behavioral and evolved adaptations and a little bit about the basics of echolocation. And once they have the basics, uh, here's a slide about echolocation. Blue. Uh, once they have the basics, this two, the two players are going to play uh, a game. They're going to share a single screen to play the uh, Predator versus Prey game. Um, and then they'll record how they play on this data sheet. Uh, so this connects to the game. They'll, they'll use the printable sheet to record how they play and if their behavior changes based on how their opponents are playing. Um, it ends with some resources about Dr. Page. There's a video about her work links to her lab in Gamboa, a link to all the publications that she's been doing, and a fun mini activity where they, they try to listen to the amount that the, the mating calls of the frogs. And, uh, and then if you go into this page right here, the Gamboa Bat Lab link at the end, uh, you can find a lot about uh, the lab itself. But if you go to that last tab, resources for kids, um, it has a lot of really fun games and videos, which I also recommend checking out. Uh, so we will go into the game, and again, it can be accessed through the Learning Lab or through that main page. Um, and we'll go, go into that now. So here's the introduction screen, and uh, by clicking on the left link, you can go over how to play the game, and uh, clicking on the right link, it goes over the main game. 
uh, you just go into straight to playing in the game. Uh, so we're going to go into how to play real quick, and then we'll go over that briefly, and then we'll go into playing the game. So uh, the game starts with um, an introduction with Dr. Page. There she is. Uh, she goes over a little bit about the science and uh, background of you know who she is and what she does. And then it splits off into two different screens, um, which represents the two different players' control. Uh, the bat player uh, will control the left side by pressing the S key to move things forward. Uh, and the frog player will control the right side by using the down arrow key. Um, so again, in this, Dr. Page is explaining about um, the basics of how to play, how to move, and the science behind why they're doing it, you know, what they're playing. Um, but I'm, I'm going to explain that in the, in the main game, so we'll, we'll probably just skip ahead here in just a second. Um, all right, so here we are. Um, you're seeing two screens right now. The bat player is on the left, and the frog player is on the right. And we'll start with the bat player. Uh, again, you can move forward by pressing the W key. You can turn left and right using the A and the D buttons. And all those question marks below, the little yellow question marks, these all represent things that the bat can hear, uh, but it's not totally sure about what they are until it uses echolocation, which clarifies what the prey is and that it can be, that can be done by pressing the E key. And this is similar to their real behavior. They have a, a good idea of what prey is below just by listening, uh, but by using echolocation, they know for sure. And that could be the difference between eating a, a juicy Tungara frog or a poisonous toad, which lo looks and sounds very similar. Uh, pressing the E button also changes its screen into an abstracted view of what it might be like to switch senses uh, or perceive the world through some entirely new sense. Once the bat understands what prey is below, it can swoop down uh, by pressing the S key, or as Dr. Page calls it, the swoop key, um, and it'll swoop down and eat something. Uh, so eating those yellow things that kind of look like butterflies, those are Katie did, which it loves to eat. Um, and then if you can see a green outline thing that looks like a frog, if it swoops down and eats that, the frog, the bat player will win. All right, so now we're going to switch over to the frog's side of the keyboard. Uh, it's a bit more complicated. Um, they're navigating the forest looking for a body of water so that they can make mating calls. Um, they need that water to make the ripples to amplify their call's volume. Because uh, basically the, the jungle is like a city and these ponds are like a, a karaoke bar <laughs> at night. Um, in the top right, you can see a mating meter. Um, since we know that frogs somehow know when, when bats are about, it's a warning to the player that, hey, you know, if you're, if you're making a call, there might be a, a, a bat around and it's going to try to eat you. Ah, there it goes right there. Ah. Um, so once the frog finds some water, they enter the water and they're prompted to enter and start their call. Uh, the first part of the call is called a whine, uh, which is that horizontal green slide bar. And they do use that right arrow to use that. And the player can choose to end the call right there like they just did, as many frogs do or continue to make more complex calls by adding one or more chucks by pressing a series of buttons there. So adding more chucks will, uh, will make the call more enticing to mates, but it also increases the threat level. Uh, as they spend more and more time on a single call, uh, the, the bat player will have a better sense of, of where they are in their location. So if you look over to the bat side, you can see there's a yellow ring around the player and it's getting more and more honed down as the player completes more truck, uh, more chucks. So the choice is in the, the frog player's hand, really. Do I, do I play it safe and risk the bat's attention or uh, do, I, do I try for a better call to find a mate? And that's the dilemma that they face every single night, that balance between between reproduction on one hand and predation on the other one. Uh, so at the very top of the frog screen, you can see a mating meter. Uh, there's a female kissy frog face on the left that uh, represents uh, an approaching mate. And so as the, the player completes a few calls, they'll, they'll find there's a bit of a sweet spot. You know, a single wine might be safe, uh, but it's not gonna fill the meter up quickly. But however, too many calls just has diminishing returns. So do I go, Low key with one chuck, the equivalent of wearing like sweatpants on the first date, or do I dress to impress and go for four chucks, the tuxedo of mating calls? 
oh my goodness, if you think our love life is hard, imagine, you know, you're on a date and a frog, or a bat swoops in and eats your date. Successfully completing enough of the calls will uh, fill that mating meter up, allowing the frog to win. Uh, it passes on its genes. It's, uh, it's, it's attracted a mate, and they will win. It only takes a few minutes to complete these games once the, once the students are really practiced, um, but we suggest they play through a lot of time so that they can record this data um, on their sheets and, and be able to make an informed decision on whether or not their behavior changed based on what their um, what their opponents were doing, you know, based on the bat versus the frog wins. What do they think is the optimal number of calls? Um, and in real life, the the real frogs are facing that same question, right? Most of the time, they're eventually deciding on two or three chucks uh, being best, which is like the equivalent of like business casual on the first frog date, um, and. And that also depends on um, the environment and the competition that they're facing. Uh, so, so Dr. Page has this really great study about how city frogs have this much more complex call uh, because there's more frog competition and way less predators in the city. And it just like to me sounds like the most interesting Hallmark movie ever. You have this city frog moves into a rural pond and falls in love with the mayor of the pond but then gets eaten by a bat because his call is too fancy. I would watch that movie. Okay, that's it for that. We're on to the final Q&A of the session. Um, and this prompt is uh, often students are hearing about myths or misconceptions or misunderstandings around natural selecting, selection and adaptation and evolution. What approaches are you using in your classroom to help dispel some of those commonly held misconceptions about these topics. Uh, right, so we will wait for the chat for a question to come in. Okay. Um, we have a question from Austin. Um, this one's about climate change. How do you get teachers interested in exploring climate change and integrating these programs back into their classrooms. Whew, um, I think that's a tough one. I, you know, again, I think it goes back to that idea of you can't do it in a vacuum. I think so much of what we're doing really needs to be like linked up somehow. You know, I, I really think there should be communication between different science classrooms, between students in different grade levels to show that there are like a lot of solutions and a lot of different things that people are doing. Um, and how can we, how can we begin to, um, you know, share some of that knowledge of what other people are doing and how can we share some of the positive stories of things that those, that those people are doing that have helped. All right. So another question from Jennifer, what are concrete actions that we can give them? That is a great question. Uh, in the, in the Secrets of the Sea Smithsonian Learning Lab collection, you can see there are like three or four tiles of like, like hard here, do this, do that. Here are things that, that other people have done by doing this thing that have created a bit of positive change. Um, there's a link to a, a Google resource that's really, really good um, that they've, they've approached that problem in it, and it's been uh, super fantastic. Um, all right. So, uh, we can move on to the general Q&A next. Um, before we do that, though, I wanted to, to share a quick screen of, of a bunch of links if you haven't seen the session PDF already. Um, and also to, to tell you at any given time, if I'm, if I'm not able to get to your question, uh, that we have um, a Twitter, Smithsonian, at Smithsonian uh, EDU, that you can at any time tweet at us and say, hey, Cody, we're trying to do this in our classroom. What do you think about this? Um, or uh, we're playing Secrets of the Sea in the classroom and we're really loving it. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, all right. So I have about five minutes left or so for some questions, and I'm going to go into it as many as I can in the next five minutes. Uh, all right. A question from Kelly. Thank you for sharing and being so entertaining. Do you have any other games that are currently in the works for us to look forward to? Uh, hi, Kelly. Um, <clears throat> 
We have a really fun project. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it yet because it's brand new. But instead of science games, um, we're looking at thinking about uh, civics and thinking about how to get students really engaged or really jazzed or really feeling like they have a voice in, in civics. Because, you know, in, in, in today's world, it's, it's just we're so politically divided and we really feel like by giving some 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 students when they're younger uh, this opportunity to practice um, practice having a voice and feeling like they have some power and, and some say in our society, you know, we think that's really important. So I think that's my next big project. Uh, I can't say much about it right now, uh, but stay tuned. Um, the next question: uh, Do you have digital games that are aligned to next? Uh, to standards that aren't in GSS. Uh, yeah, sure, we do. We, I mean, the Smithsonian has tons and tons of games. Um, we, uh, you know, I'm not the only game designer. We have a lot from American history uh, that if you go into um, the App Store, there's one called Ripped Apart. And that's looking at um, some stories from the Civil War using actual actual resources, actual uh, um, letters and correspondence from the Civil War. And there's a bit of a mystery to, to discover with that. Um, and I can't remember which standard it is, uh, but there are some, some social studies standards that that one's aligned to. Um, we have uh, a ton of, of kind of art standards that we're really uh, trying to push throughout the learning lab that the next project that I'm doing will probably have some, um, some art standardization that, that has been aligned to. Uh, we, we use a lot of Project Zero, a lot of Harvard Project Zero thinking routines um, within all of our lessons, but many of the games that we're doing as well of trying to get students to think um, critically about what they're playing. Uh, so there are some, um, I can't, off the top of my head, I, I don't know what all the standards are, but there are different Smithsonian games that are aligned that aren't just science. Uh, is there a vocabulary list assist uh, to assisted to assist the elementary classes and uh judy that is a great question um often when i'm working with scientists especially for you know aligning it to fourth and fifth grade and the scientists will start with well you know first the phytoplankton plankton go through all these krebs cycles and the zooxanthellae uh are um you know accepting all of the you know and then they go into like all these really detailed complex words that the fourth and fifth graders are like, Zuzan, what? Um, so often what we're trying to do is simplify a lot of those words. And then once they understand the concept, then we'll bring in the word like Zuzanthale or, you know, phytoplankton or photosynthesis so that they understand, oh, photosynthesis is, is the, the process of moving sun energy into to food energy. Um, and so we do, we don't have a, an actual list of like, this is what this is, this is what this is. We try to integrate it throughout the experience, but that is a really helpful idea and something to think about um, to add to these. So thank you for that question. Uh, access to the games. Can a uh, question from Mary May, can an entire class use the website at the same time using any of the three games? Is it a free kit for any and all of us to use? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. It's all browser-based. They can play it through anything from Chrome to uh, to Safari to Firefox, um, Microsoft Edge, right? You don't need anything special to download or play. They're totally free. Uh, you don't need to pay a subscription or anything. Um, all of them have closed captions. They're all based out of the web browsers. Um, yeah, a whole class can play three totally different games at the same time. Good question. I'm glad. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, all right, Shelley from the National Zoo. We are definitely going to work together sometime. We I had a workshop at the National Zoo about inquiry methods, and I was so impressed with the educators there. So we just got to figure out what the what it is. Um, a question from Lara: Do you have a biography video that we can use to show kids about careers related to video game design? Oh, I was that took me on a loop, uh, Laura. I was definitely thinking a different career, but not video game design. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I've given with the webinars that I've given, I talk a little bit about, you know, my own kind of evolution as a game designer. And, and this is going to be the last question because I only have about 30 seconds left. Um, 
for me that it wasn't a straight shot you know it was a very winding curve when i grew up playing video games that the career just didn't exist i i thought nintendo was this magical land that wizards lived in and created these out of like you know like like harry potter magic spells um and nowadays you there's just there's entire like master degree programs about making games and there's so many v ways to to learn on on youtube and and tutorials and that kind of thing so it's much easier now uh than when i was here but i don't have a, a video biography about you know my journey but there probably are some online so that is my time um thank you again so much for your time in uh in the session and uh, i really appreciate your attendance and all the work that you do. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out and we'll be in touch.